which is there was a lot of leap of faith um, in order to get over the line. And I think we all fall into the trap, don't we, of presuming that there was an inevitability of getting it over the line. It wasn't until the 59th minute of the, uh, of the 11th hour, those of us who sort of followed it closely remember. Do you, do you think in this sort of social media driven age, which looks to echo chambers and so on and so forth, um, that it could have been delivered then, would that bravery and leadership and courage have been trimmed? Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that social media wasn't a big factor when I was Prime Minister. <laughs> well, I think, I think that's answered that mean, question. Right. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a, frankly, I mean, it's got many good things about it, but it's a plague on modern politics. Sure. sure. And it makes life really difficult. Sure. But I think the only way that you can, you can lead in these circumstances is just to put it to one side. And so I think, look, it was still a very charged atmosphere. Mm. But, and, and it may be that, you know, when, when we came to office, um, you know, it was the, there was a, a great first flush of enthusiasm. I, I don't mean necessarily from the people to the government, but the government felt that it had. Well, th things could only get better. We won't join in a chorus of it, but. Uh... No, no, probably not the best thing to do. Um, <laughs> but um, so we, we, we had a key ambition, and it may be because when you come in as a new government, your, your, your feeling of possibility is, is greater than when yes. you, you carry on over time, you, you become a, a little more realistic about things. And, and frankly, it did require um, an almost unrealistic sense of possibility in order to get the thing back together again. But it really, even right into going into the Good Friday Agreement negotiation, I mean, the thing had actually collapsed on the eve of that negotiation because it became clear that whatever had been agreed in principle by the British and Irish officials uh, with Senator Mitchell was unacceptable to, to unionism. When I got to, um, to Belfast that, that day, it was absolutely apparent that unless we essentially started again, mm. uh, we were not going to get an agreement. So I, I think, and even throughout those, those days of the negotiation, I would say it came together and collapsed several times before yeah. we eventually reached an agreement. And in the, in the run-up to it, what there was was an appetite to have an agreement. That was the, the only thing that kept me going and I think kept the team going during that time was that you could definitely feel that people wanted it to happen. Um, and I think that was the difference from previous years. And was, and was that local politicians responding to a, a pressure from, the, from, from grassroots across Northern Ireland or was it leadership telling people that they should it, it was a bit of people both, had had enough uh, it, it was a bit of both people were exhausted by the conflict yeah. uh, it was apparent that as it were neither side nor the commas could 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 win um, and so the only solution was either to continue with 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 what had been the um, the situation in Northern Ireland which was obviously terrible um, for the people there and and for the whole of the um, the United Kingdom, or you could try and strive to reach an agreement. Mm -hmm. But I do think there was also, there was a new generation of leaders. Yeah. And I think it's important to emphasize as a, as, a, as a lesson of this whole process, that it could never have happened without real leadership being exercised by the political parties. Mm -hmm. And each of them had to say things to their own followers that were uncomfortable, that people didn't like. And that is the true mark of leadership in the end. Because any fool can tell the people that support you what they want to hear. It's when you're telling them what they don't want to hear that, that yes. the test of leadership is, is, is forged. And you know, David Trimble was the leader of the unionist community. I mean, David was an absolutely devoted unionist, but believed the time had come to try and reach agreement. Uh, the Sinn Féin leadership were in a different position from the position they've been in um, in previous years. Um, Seamus Mallon, the SDLP, it's worth saying, they were, they were people who took a, a lot of risks for peace. Then there were, you know, the parties that are now more significant, like the Alliance Party and so on, the Women's Coalition, they were also agitating for a, 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 new, um, a new direction. 
And even though the DUP at the time were opposed to the agreement, I think they were uh, opposed to it, but willing to wait and see how things turned out. And you know, it's worth recording that Ian Paisley also um, showed leadership when he finally took the, the, the DUP into government. So I think, um, <coughs> yeah, there was, a, there was a different generation of leaders. And it's very important to understand that the, the, the Taoiseach at the time, Bertie Ahern, was also a different type of leader yes. who was interested yes. in a good relationship between um, the British and the Irish. He wasn't really, he, he wasn't, he was obviously came from the history and, and his um, lineage was very much dominated by the history of the conflict, but he was prepared to think differently. Cool. Uh, one of your predecessors uh, said the worst thing in or being a prime minister was events, dear boy, events. And we know that shortly, your first government, or first ministry, was obviously dominated by a lot of constitutional reform, setting up the Welsh Assembly, the Scottish Parliament, and obviously everything that flowed from the Good Friday Agreement. Conflagration in the uh, Middle East obviously took up a huge amount of HMG bandwidth. Was that uh, a, a negative distraction, as it were? Because I, I did the support from Westminster through to Belfast to make sure that the show was kept on the road. It, it clearly needed greater nurturing than Cardiff and, and, and Edinburgh. And there seem to be two big questions which certainly other commentators appear to have suggested may have been envisaged to be sorted <coughs> out in 2000, 2001, 2002. Legacy and um, a fleshing out of the criteria of, that, that may or may not lead to a border poll. Is that a fair assessment? Are there things that you saw would have been more immediate in that process which had begun by the Good Friday Agreement, which then got derailed because of larger events? And looking back, is that a disappointment? No, I, I would really say it, it, it once we got the, the, the Good Friday stroke Belfast Agreement up and running and in place, preserving it became a, a vital priority of the government. And so I don't, I didn't, you know, yes, of course, the, the, the events post 9-11 uh, were hugely important mm. and took up a lot of time, but they never displaced Northern yeah. Ireland as a priority. And I think, you know, the record would show that I continued both engaging with the issue personally, yes. making visits. You know, we used to have these weekends away where we would try and resolve thorny issues. No, it was always going to be um, a top priority for us. And some of the issues, because the Good Friday Agreement, it, it, it was a framework which then a whole lot of other things had to happen. Mm. But all of those things were difficult. And, you know, to this day they remain difficult, even after, you know, the events of 9-11 have a long yes. past, as it were. So, no, I, I, I don't think... I, if people are saying we were distracted afterwards, no, we weren't. We. So, so is there anything you, I know, kick yourself about that you go, I just wish, whilst we had that sort of new enthusiastic momentum, I just wish we'd sorted out this, that or the other.
um, you know, we were always trying to sort things out, but the problem is it, it's, you had to get things in a certain state of readiness because you, yeah. you know, th the thing about a, a, a conflict such as this is that the levels of distrust are very deep. And the levels of distrust are not displaced by the agreement, by the way. Yeah. It's really yeah, important to important understand that. To it, mind, it wasn't yeah. that people did the agreement and then they shook hands and said, okay, we're all friends now. No, the distrust continued. And therefore, if you take a, an, a, an issue like decommissioning, <coughs> which you know, it was an incredibly difficult question, right? Um, there was never any way you were going to have a sustainable executive unless the IRA gave up violence and gave it up completely. On the other hand, because of what they believed they had been through, they were constantly thinking, you're going to get us to, to give up this armed struggle but not actually make the changes on policing or criminal justice or the things that are on the other side of the ledger. Mm -hmm. And likewise with unionists, they would say, look, we're going to make all these concessions of change, but you're going to allow the IRA to carry on being the same violent organization. So there were levels of distrust between the parties and there were levels of distrust aimed at the UK government. And, you know, that's, that's the way it is. Yes. And it, probably continues in the same way today. Them's the breaks, as one of your successors might have said. <laughs> Robert, right. back up. Yes, um, so Jenny, I want to ask you about um, the underpinning elements of the European Convention on Human Rights and the Human Rights Act as part of the Good Friday Agreement. Much debate currently about whether or not the Human Rights Act needs reform. There's a Bill of Rights that's currently before the House of Commons, it doesn't seem to be emerging from the long grass particularly, but it is a different way of approaching uh, uh, human rights. Do you think that amendments or reforms to the Human Rights Act um, will help or hinder the process in Northern Ireland? Um, yeah, I think this has got a, some dimensions that are broader than uh, the issue we're under discussion. Look. My view is it's the, the European Convention on Human Rights is important. It's an important obligation of the country. Um, I understand all the frustrations dealing with it. I had a lot of frustrations myself. Um, but I still think it's an important part of the... Of, um, it's, it's, an, it's an important part of the, the structure that, that holds up the, the agreement and the... Um, and the sense that the, there is always recourse to, to something fundamental when judging um, individual actions or situations. So, you know, I wouldn't be in favour myself of, of changing it in relation to the agreement. No. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Jim Shannon. Sure, thank you. Yeah, and uh, it's very nice to see you. Sir Tony, I don't think we've actually ever met until perhaps today and face to face, so, so it's a, a pleasure. Although obviously you've had a big, play, a big part to play in, in the affairs of Northern Ireland and we uh, respect that and understand that. Ever mindful, Mr Chairman, of, the, uh, of, of that uh, soundbite that the hand of history is on your shoulder, Dr Paisley, and, and probably to Martin McGuinness as well. Um, it might have been a soundbite, but perhaps they, the hand of history was on their shoulder. And I think you, you probably uh, captured it that very well. It's very important, of course, uh, that the uh, Belfast and Good Friday Agreement move forward in a, in, in a suitable way. We as a party in the DUP, I was part of the Assembly from 1998 right through to 2010 before I came here. Um, I, I um, recognised uh, through Dr Pesey's leadership, as I think you did as well, uh, and through the leadership of Mark McGuinness, uh, <coughs> that there was two people with very, very different point of views that were coming together to, to um, push forward a, a democratic process that, that could encapsulate the political views of both traditions in Northern Ireland. So I, I recognise that as well. I supported Dr Paisley in that uh, at that time. Um, uh, but most of the party did and, and those that didn't perhaps uh, um, uh, fell in behind as time progresses as they seen the, the positives of it. But the point I'm, I want to make if I can please, uh, when Dr Paisley and Martin McGuinness uh, from different parts of the community recognise that the, the um, Belfast and Good Friday Agreement, or the St Andrews Agreement as we had then, that, that took it to the next stage, was a way forward. Um, I think you recognised 
I, I perceive you recognise uh, that, and from what you've said so far, it's very clear that you that you did uh, that that the political process could never go anywhere unless two communities at least uh, perf brought together a process, uh, and the assembly was that process to to move forward. So, looking forward to today, uh, your thoughts upon where we are um, um, in the process and and how the um, Belfast, Good Friday, St Andrews Agreement has moved where it is now to the um, the, the ones are framework. Um, uh, we're, we're very conscious and I've seen your comments in the, in the paper, uh, Sir Tony. <coughs> comments that you referred to Bertie Ahern, you referred, and, and both yourself and Bertie Ahern, to architects of the, of the political process as we move forward. Um, you both said that, that nothing can happen within the, the Windsor framework uh, or with any agreement going forward if unionism isn't part of that process. I think you recognised that oh, way, way back in, in those early days. So looking forward um, to today, uh, is it your opinion uh, that, that the involvement of unionism, and, and I represent a, a large section of unionism, as does my colleague here, Carla Lockhart as well, we cannot move forward unless the unionism is part of that process. Ever mindful of what you've done, what Bertie Ahern done, what Dr. Pizzi done, and ultimately what Martin <coughs> McGuinness done? Yeah, sure, Jim. Yeah, unionism's got to be part of the process. It, it's uh, the whole basis of the of, of the agreement is that the, the different elements in in the politics of Northern Ireland uh, come together, and and that cross community um, working together that's that's of the essence of the agreement. I mean, obviously, I hope unionism can, you know, I mean, we can talk about the Northern Ireland Protocol, I'm very happy to, but, but of course, no, as a matter of principle, unionism has got to be, has, has got to be involved, otherwise it won't work. Yeah, you, you mentioned in your, inter just, just, yes, please. Yeah, you mentioned that, um, Sir Tony, in, in your comments, and you, and you, yeah, I think it's a realism that you had, where, where you, you looked at the both political parties, and you, and I'm just taking your introductory words, which I'm, I'm, I'm seizing upon them if I can, where you said that they, um, the parties had to go back, although we did not agree with it at that time, go back to 1988, uh, but the parties had to agree on something to move forward. Um, is there not really a realism, or has to be a realism, in today, in, in the political process in, in Northern Ireland? Uh, your words were, a realism or start again. I think there has to be a realism with the Windsor framework, or, or, or start again. Yeah, no, that, that, there has to be a, a, a realism, but I think, I mean, to go straight to the point, Jim, on the, on the, the, the Windsor uh, agreement and the, and the protocol, the problem is we're trying to reconcile, um, you know, the inevitable two different elements that come from, from, from Brexit and its impact on, on Northern Ireland. Mm. So. You know, once you, for the first time, you, you end up with a, a situation where the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom are in a different relationship to Europe and in a different relationship to its customs union and single market, then the border between north and south in, 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 on the island of Ireland becomes the, the frontier between the EU and the UK. And... Um, so inevitably, there is, there is a problem because you want the, the border to be open. That's always how it's been. And, and the one point of, of, of consensus amongst all the parties in Northern Ireland is keep the border between North and South open, quite rightly, um, because that makes life easier for, for, for everyone. But once that border then becomes the external border of the EU, you've, you've, you've got a problem because you're not in the same relationship with the customs union and the single market. And, the, the idea was to ensure that Northern Ireland retained the benefits of being in the uh, single market, keep the border open, but that then leads the European Union to say, well, yeah, but how, how do we then manage the rules of the single market? So it was always going to be a difficult circle to square, um, and the protocol is a, and the, and the Windsor Agreement are attempt to square it. So I think the question is, but the realism is that 
there is no real answer <laughs> to this problem because, I mean, I, you know, just to say when John Major and I went to Northern Ireland during the course of the referendum, we said this is going to be a problem because it obviously was going to be a problem. There's no, I don't think there's no theoretical answer to it. There is a practical answer. And my reason for supporting what the government, uh, this Prime Minister has done on, on the Windsor Agreement is that I think it represents the most practical way forward that minimises all the theoretical objections. It doesn't remove them, but it, it means that they're going to be practically, should be, in most circumstances, practically insignificant. And, and that is honestly what, uh, the best I think you can do with this. I appreciate your answer, but uh, you. uh, we want to make sure that the, the winter framework does not Jim, become the you. winter Jim, not. Jim, Jim, thank, you, no, thank you very much indeed. Um, we, we mentioned at the top of the session um, the lack of inevitability of landing the Good Friday Agreement. 25 years on, do you think there's, a, there's sufficient public knowledge, particularly amongst younger people, of both the significance of the event, and do you think that there's an underpricing of the dividend that peace actually is for Northern uh, Ireland. Yes and yes. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's only natural. Life moves on, and that's one of the great things about it, that life does move on, and people don't, don't think about it in the same way. But w when I was growing up in politics, as it were, I mean, every day the news mm. would be full of um, stories of fresh acts of terrorism, assassination, um, conflict. Uh, it was a it was a very ugly and difficult situation that people lived through in Northern Ireland. And, and you know, you, you, you barely went a week in the UK without it leading the news and virtually always in a, negative, in a negative way. And I think, you know, if you look at Northern Ireland today, its GDP, I think, is virtually doubled. Its per in capita income is virtually doubled. The number of people coming through its airport has doubled. The number of tourists has more than doubled. So it's, and Belfast is a, if I can use it uh, in this context, is a great European city today um, and, and recognized as such. You know, it's a great, yes. great place. So no, I think there is a, it's, it's natural, but there is an insufficient recognition. And there's also, I think, a, an insufficient recognition of the importance, therefore, of keeping this going. Because it's, I think, one thing that I did underestimate is that I always thought it would be a process and it would take time. But I think the difference with Northern Ireland and most peace processes, and I've, I've had a lot to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, mm. and one difference in favor of the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that in, in theory at least, there is an agreement as to the the, 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 the final outcome, which is a two-state solution. Now, it's uh, you know, gone way off course, plainly. But if you were to ask people in the international community, they would say, OK, but we know where we want to get to. It's just that it seems impossible to get to it. But with the Northern Ireland conflict, we've never resolved the central question of the United Ireland or the United Kingdom. And therefore, the, the, in a way, part of the in the outstanding result of, of, of the agreement was absent that agreement as to the eventual outcome and an agreement that people would disagree as to what the ultimate solution would be, there was nonetheless the opportunity to bring peace. And we did that by, by the, there was a, an intellectual framework at the heart of the agreement, which is an, in, in essence the acceptance by republicanism and nationalism of the principle of consent, that Northern Ireland would remain part of the UK for as long as the majority of people wanted it, and in return for that, the creation of institutions that people in, felt were just and, and would resolve some of the feelings of injustice, mm. and would also reflect, and this is where the strand two and strand three were important of the agreement, would reflect the nationalist aspirations of, a, a, um, of, of well, almost half of the community in Northern Ireland. So it, the, the was, the, the, there was a, a construct around the agreement that had its own coherence, and we would never have succeeded without that. But implementing each of the stages of this was agonizing, and it is, it's, it's disappointing that we're still 
you know, we're still dealing with many of those issues, and that distrust is deep. And by the way, you can tell the distrust because you know, every time you hear a politician, including myself, speak about the Good Friday Agreement, occasionally, particularly when you've got an eye on the unionist audience, you call it a Belfast Agreement. And then we try and resolve that by saying, well, it's a Good Friday stroke Belfast Agreement or a Belfast Agreement. But that is an indication. And if you're in Derry, London Derry, it gets entirely right. confused. Yes. So it's, you know, it is, it's a, that's the way it is. Um, but it's still a world better. You know, whatever the problems in Northern Ireland, what people should never forget, it's a world better from where it was. And if we exercise common sense and realism today, we can keep the peace intact and you know, ensure there is a situation where whatever difficulties and challenges there are in Northern Ireland can be resolved by negotiation and agreement, not violence. I mean, have you got any thoughts? I mean, you know, you were often sort of seen as one of the great sort of political communicators of recent years, but have you got any thoughts about how that message can be um, distilled and indeed received by a younger audience in Northern Ireland, without sort of scaring them of the, you know, blood on the streets and the crashing down of buildings and bombs and so on and so forth, um, in order to have a higher regard for the for the for the peace dividend? I mean, I, colleagues are fed up with me saying this, but if you watch the last couple of episodes of Derry Girls, for example, there's that wonderful montage at the end where it said where it shows the horror and then it shows the huge enthusiasm and hope and worry on the older generation's face on referendum day itself and then the joy and relief we've got something over the line we've got something to work with what what if, if you were in number 10 today what would you and and be encouraging your government and the leaders of the parties in northern ireland to do to build that understanding of don't risk slipping back. Well, first of all, I think I would focus a lot on economic and social progress and the need to do more. There are still communities in, in Northern Ireland that are severely disadvantaged. Um, and wherever there is the alienation from the mainstream and people feel they don't, don't have hope and opportunity economically and socially, there's, there's always going to be the, the, it's a fertile ground for those people who want to lure them into to, to violence. But the second thing I think is to you know, it's, so, so if you look at Northern Ireland today and, 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 you know, I still follow closely what happens. I don't go because it's probably not sensible for me to start. I don't want to ever seem to interfere and it's hard enough for your successor to do the job without um, a previous person on an issue sensitive in Northern Ireland telling, tell, telling what should happen. But I, I mean, I, Okay, I am a, I'm a unionist, by the way. I mean, I, you know, my preferred outcome is that Northern Ireland stays in the union. Um, so, <laughs> but there's a new member. There's there's a new member of the Tony Blair fan club, I think, well, forward, yeah. Shannon. So I imagine, there could be an application form. I'm probably, about, office, I'm probably about to say something that's going to, to lose my latest. All right, okay. <laughs> don't, don't write the check yet, Jim. Well, I know. Um. <laughs> since, since, since I don't have a lot of them, it's unwise to um, dissuade those that are. But so here's basically the way I see the politics in Northern Ireland, how it's developed, is that. Republicanism, in the end, decided to change its strategy. Right. Now, you can agree with whether you think they're sincere or not sincere. I mean, you even have all, the, all those agreements, disagreements. But essentially, they came to the conclusion that the armed struggle was not going to yield what they thought. Right. Now, leave aside the fact that we believe that morally they should have been engaged in it, but they came to the view politically it wasn't going to succeed. And so they've shifted their strategy. And even though it's posed a lot of problems, it, politically actually, for the SDLP, who were there a, a long time before, it's been, I think you would have to say from their own point of view, quite a successful political strategy, right? I completely understand, I think, and, and hope where unionism comes from. And I always say to people, you know, one of my earliest memories around Northern Ireland was my grandmother saying to me, there's a great beacon of hope in Northern Ireland, his name's Ian Paisley. 
And, you know, this was... Get the checkbook out, Jim. <laughs> you know, this was... So I was Too always... Much. You know, I was brought up very much within a unionist household. And I understand that the fear of unionism is that everything is a slippery slope, right? Mm. You're basically always, if you, if, you, if you accept the types of compromises that are in the Good Friday Agreement, if you accept British-Irish relationships, if you accept North, South, and what you're, you're always going to be sliding towards that United Ireland. And that strategy, I don't think, has really changed over the years. I'm um, quite blunt about it. It's always been like that. And that's why, even though, I say this quite honestly, even though at one level it was always strange for unionism or any part of unionism to support Brexit because it would plainly put the, <laughs> the issues of Northern Ireland in a diff difficult context. On the other hand, I kind of accept for the same reason that a lot of people in my old constituency voted Brexit. Some people thought, mistakenly in my view, that the more British thing to do was to vote Brexit. Right. And therefore, if you're part of unionism, you kind of think, well, well, why not? The thing is, that strategy has not really changed. But the third element that's come into Northern Ireland politics in these last years, which I think is you know, worth thinking about, is, is the Alliance Party has hmm. risen, right? So it's not, I don't know, what do you look at the polls? It's not 15% or something, around about there. Um, when I was uh, Prime Minister, I don't think there was an Alliance MP. I think the first one was 2010. And if you look at the age range of those voters, I think they'll be probably in the, in the middle, in the middle range, right? And the Alliance, probably predominantly there, are unionist people. Pro probably. I mean, okay. Maybe not, but... <laughs> but the point is... I'm not sure anything. But the, but the point is, if you want to preserve the union today, the best way of doing it is to recognize the status quo is the union. So make people comfortable with the status quo. Because the more comfortable they are, and this is, I'm quite sure at the back of their mind, the risk the Republicans think of with their political strategy is that people are comfortable with the status quo by changing. But if the status quo becomes subject to constant disruption and constant political difficulty, then that middle-aged bulge that's there with the alliance at the moment, there's going to be another one coming up in a younger generation, and then things are going to get more difficult for the union. And that's why I'm, you know, I support the positions I support because I believe passionately in the end the people of Northern Ireland should decide their own future. But I come at it from the point of view of someone, who, you know, I want my country to stay strong. That's why I'm, I'm opposed to the SNP in Scotland and why I, my preference is that Northern Ireland remains part of the union. But it can only be that way, in my view, if people feel the status quo is something stable. So this is where I think, you know, when you, you ask me what is the, what do I think about the politics now, I think the important thing is to get over this problem of the protocol, if at all possible to get back into some, uh, to, 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 to an agreement to reform the executive, get back into power, and then, you know, over time to deal with these, these issues. But the less stability there is in the system, the more it makes me anxious about the future. Sorry, that's a long way of putting it. No, but. no, I, I'm. I mean, that's given me a lot. Certainly, given me a lot to think about. That sort of make the status quo attractive. Mm -hmm. Robin, uh, so given given the emphasis you just put on stability, um, uh, we've had twenty five years of the devolved institutions, but they've only been functioning about forty percent of that time. And you know, as you'll know very well, there are various different reasons. Um, the, the, that have been given for the, the various breakdowns that have taken place. Um, how big a disappointment is that? And um, what do you think could be done institutionally? We've heard from other witnesses that you know, the, the intention of the agreement was always for the institutions to evolve. Do you think there's more evolution that could have happened to support stability? Um, 
yeah, of course it's disappointing. Um, it's, it's maybe less surprising um, given all the challenges. I think that the, I, I would like to have seen strand two and strand three more, more vigorously used. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the relationship between the British and the Irish governments, I mean, okay, it's been, it's been scratchy recently, but let's hope that's resolved. I mean, ultimately, it's, we've got a lot in common, we can work together. I think, I, I think we, we, we could do more to make those strands more meaningful and, and, and more active, frankly. And, and, and just on, I mean, on that, the, the relationship between the governments, but also the relationship between <laughs> London and Belfast and, and, and devolution in that respect, how do you think the NIO, the UK government, uh, can s do more to support the devolved institutions and support stability of those without being seen as the, the mothership, without being seen to be lying in wait to take over? And I well, well remember periods in, in the run-up to NDNA when at the NIO we were having to look at two tracks of work, one about how to get agreement and, and, and bring the parties together, and another thinking about what would happen if we didn't. Um, yeah. how, how can we avoid that situation keeping on coming up? Uh, I'm not sure you can, to be absolutely <laughs> blunt about it. I, th I think you'll carry on. And look, the officials in the Northern Ireland office, you know, they come under a lot of criticism from all sides, but I mean, they're basically people trying to find ways through the, the, the difficulties. But I think the most, the most important thing is, is to try and, you know, as the, to be fair, the government's done, I mean, you try and resolve the issues over the protocol, try and get back to um, a devolved government. And then, you know, it's, it's one of these things you just constantly got to keep on it. Mm. Um, and, and it does require, it does require the time um, and, and focus sometimes of the Prime Minister and not just of the Secretary of State. Um, Robert Buckland wants to come in a quick one, and then Mary. Well, well I'll, I'll just de develop your well-made point about associating the union with stability. Uh, it's absolutely plain as a bike staff to me that the more that people in Northern Ireland feel that membership of the United Kingdom equals good public services, stable institutions, they're going to want to stay. Uh, and that does beg the question about the St Andrews Agreement um, of the, the St Andrews mm. Agreement and the current way in which the executive is formed. I mean, could an answer be to go back to the status quo before the St Andrews Agreement, where you, you had the the, uh, the cross the common slate approach and the cross community agreement, which you know various times various parties have supported. Uh, you know, there was one point where the DUP supported that approach in order to prevent Sinn Féin from coming into the executive but obviously you know with the elections and the change in the power structure we've now institutionalized this sort of you know this twin party approach and your point about the change in politics in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland might be the alliance in one election might be another uh, party or another group you know, how do is, that, is this not now getting in the way of the very stability that we all want to see? Yeah, I, I've got an awful feeling that the, the words to haunt principles might uh, come into <laughs> well, it. Well, we have had, ev <laughs> we've had evidence about Which I, I hope that we never have to hear again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I know the feeling. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> I, look, I think... There's, a, there's, there's always a case for, 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 for change, and there's a case for change, particularly now with the, the emergence of the Alliance uh, Party. Um, and I think the North Belfast Political Action Group of Schools, this had been an interesting document the other day, which was um, set out uh, how young people view this. But the truth of the matter is, as we discovered, and this is why we did St Andrews, you can only do these things by agreement. If, it, if, if, if it's not, the thing you can, you can never do with this situation is say, right, I'm just going to decide what's right in principle and I'm, 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 I'm just going to do it. And I used to be called, called <laughs> constantly when I was prime minister, just go and do it. Um, <laughs> you just can't. It's not, you, you've, got to, you've got to reach these changes by, by consensus. Um, and, and if you can't get that consensus, if one part of the community 
feels that it's aimed, this, the change is aimed at them or is reducing their, what they believe is their, their legitimate rights, it's just, we won't get it done, is my experience, which is, you know, why I always used to say to people on the nationalist and republican side that the relationship between the British government and unionism is much more complicated than you think. They would sort of say to us, go and tell the unionists what to do. I said, have you met these guys? They're not going to just do what the British government says, right? So you're going to have to persuade them. Um, and which is, you know, from their point of view, quite right. Uh, Mary Kelly Foy. Thank you, Chair. Um, and um, good morning, Sir Tony, and greetings from County Durham. Um, I think my, my first question will be a, a relatively easy one. Um, could, you, could you just tell us, and you have touched on it a bit, what, what it is that's pleased, surprised, and disappointed you most about the Good Friday Agreement? Well, the disappointment was obviously the continuing instability. Um, I'm not sure anything has much surprised me. <laughs> um, but what's pleased me is the fact of the agreement and it, the peace is still there. It may seem fragile, but I think it is still there. And I don't think there's a desire in any part of the community in Northern Ireland with any substantial support to displace that peace. And, you know, when you look around the world and, and you know, as I say, I was involved in the Israeli-Palestinian, still am actually, and in that particular issue, you know, you realize how difficult it is to, to, to get to any form of peace agreement. So we should celebrate the fact that we did, um, and then we should use that celebration as a, a reason for redoubling efforts to preserve it. Okay. Um, secondly, you, you'll be aware of, of, uh, around the, the sensitivities and the debate about the, the, the legacy issues. What was it that you envisaged um, on, the, on the subject of legacy? You mean in relation to the victims? The troubles, yeah. yeah. The well, the legacy bill that's yeah. just gone through Parliament. But what were your intentions in terms of Our intentions were, those were probably the same as this government to try and find a, a way of resolving it. But frankly, we couldn't and, and, and didn't. And it remains extremely <laughs> difficult. So I wish I, I could. Uh, I mean, I think whoever grapples with that is going to find it really tough to do. That's the truth. Yeah, and did you anticipate that 25 years on we'd still see paramilitaries in the form of criminal gangs? I think you were, that, that, it doesn't surprise me that there are, there are groups that will try and disturb the peace from time to time. Um, what would disturb me is that I thought they were starting to gain substantial support. Now, you need to watch this the whole time. You need to watch it on the Republican side, watch it on the Loyalist side. But I don't, I mean, look, other representatives here from Northern Ireland know better than me, but I still think that the desire in the vast majority of people is to resolve issues, uh, issues peacefully. Yeah. OK, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Do you I mean, just on the parallels, 25 years on, huge efforts to transition. Is there a cut-off point to the process of transition? Or does it get masked by this more than Irish exceptionalism argument? It's, I mean, I think, but particularly when you start to get real turbulence, you know, over the process and, and the politics, I think you're you know, you're going to find these these groups starting, but you, you, it's important to remember that they only managed to get traction over the over the situation when they had real support within the community, and I don't think that support exists at the moment. But I'm not, you know, I'm not no. deep in the detail of it today, and and frankly, you'd be better asking that of the Secretary of State or indeed the members of Parliament representing Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, we have uh, Claire Hannah. Uh, I've got Claire, and then. 
Carla wants to come in and then Stephen, I'm coming to you. Thank you very much. Certainly really enjoying your, your inputs today. Um, just thinking back to the early implementation <coughs> years, um, Jonathan Powell, your, your colleague, said recently, in retrospect, we should have been willing to be a bit tougher and that's something that um, resonated with me. D do you think that there was um, some damage sustained to, to the culture and, and the sense of trust within the process? Um, maybe a bit of moral hazard in allowing deadlines to slip um, in allowing parties to sort of talk about the agreement but to do things that were clearly in contravention to the to the spirit of exclusively peaceful and, and democratic means and I'm thinking at this point about decommissioning and, and not supporting um, the, the rule of law. Um, do, do you think that that was a factor in, in, in part did that do for uh, David Trimble and his electoral support and has that therefore had a had a knock-on impact that the, the main party of unionism wasn't there advocating for the agreement? Does that contribute to some of the low levels of support we have in unionism now? Yeah, well, it's a very re reasonable question and one I, I uh, agonised over a lot. Um, and, you know, I think... Um, I'm, I'm, made a speech once about the process of ambiguity ending and acts of completion being necessary and it came to the point where as it were you know we, we had to say to the IRA look it's you've got to stop everything it's got to be absolutely clear and not just the the paramilitary violence but the violence within the communities and you know you could yeah you can make the argument we should have done this earlier but the problem was that we were trying to manage a situation where you were trying to get to the right outcome, but always conscious of the fact that you might lose either unionism on one side, republicanism on the other side. I always, one of the things I found most difficult and most troubling, and I used to have this debate a lot with Seamus Mallon, because Seamus used to say to me, you pay attention to the Republicans because they got the weapons and that's the very thing that's contrary to the principle that you should be trying to uphold and it's a perfectly reasonable point but as I used to say to him okay Seamus but if you're prepared to go into government without them and with the unions okay we can have a conversation but you you know you you can't really do that and so it was always difficult and you know I look I, I uh, <coughs> I understand from the SDOP point of view, because after all the, speaking for a moment as a member of the Labour Party, it's the SDLP that's our sister party, so I completely get it, but it, it, the difficulty was, you can go in retrospect and say, um, we should have been tougher, but when you were there at the time, it was, <laughs> you were trying to make sure that the best wasn't the enemy of the good. I mean, that's the honest answer. The, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, we, we, would, we would sometimes say. But did, did, did uh, and build on, on Robert's question about the changes at St Andrews, did you foresee, and I, and I, and I understand the points you're making about dealing with the, uh, the moment as it was, did you foresee the polarisation that would follow and, and, and ripple on for, for these 20 years later of, of bringing, I suppose, those harder line views into the centre? And I, uh, I appreciate that maybe the logic was that it prevented them from sort of screaming in the windows and, and thwarting the implementation as they were doing. But had you stepped out the polarisation that it would probably continue electorally? Yeah, so I think... Bill's house is a haven for some of the darkest spirits you can ever imagine. My view of this has always been that, that it, it... I didn't predict this, but when I look back on it, I think maybe it should, it should have been predictable, that when you first begin something completely new, as this was, that both communities default to the people they think are going to stand up for them, in inverted commas. So Sinn Féin gain on the nationalist side, the DP gain on the unionist side. Now, my view is if the stability is there and continues over time, you know, over time politics changes. You know, over time the issue should be in Northern Ireland, who's going who's to make the right reforms to make the health service work better? Who's going to do best on education? Who's going to make sure that, that 
you know, communities that are deprived are, are brought up to, to a better standard of life. Whilst the politics is dominated by the feeling that the thing isn't really stabilised and therefore you've got to stick with your own, the people, as I say, who in inverted commas, and I put it in inverted commas, will stand up for your community, I think it's going to be difficult. But politics is a long game often and I do think you know, the, the rise of the Alliance Party in this respect is important, you know, because you, you're, and it may be that in time, the, the, you know, the SDLP can find the right way of improving its position. And you see this, you know, it's, you see this all over the devolved politics of the UK. And it's a very, look, it's a very, sometimes I have people particularly on the right who say to me, look, as a result of devolution, you know, you gave Scottish nationalism a big boost, right? And I always say to them, you think Scottish nationalism was invented by the last Labour government? There were decades before. If, you hadn't, if we hadn't done devolution, the choice in Scotland would have been between a status quo with no devolution and independence. And in those circumstances, I can tell you over time, there would have been a real move for independence, whereas I still think that my view is that Scotland will probably in the end believe its best chance remains with the UK. But I think if you hadn't done devolution, you would have put that stark choice before people. And in the same way in, in Northern Ireland, ultimately, the benefit of the Northern Ireland Assembly should be in the long term that people decide their own future there. And provided that the border doesn't become an obstacle, you know, in the end, I think people, people, people will decide to fight the politics of Northern Ireland around who does best for the people, not who, as it were, again, in inverted commas, stands up for the people. Indeed, and the question was motivated about just looking at those dynamics of polarisation rather than, rather than strict electoral outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, good morning, Sir Tony. And, uh, oh, oh, sorry. For, I'm so oh, sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. Sorry. Terrible, Chairman. Oh, Carla. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, you know. No. This is on this point. Thank you, and uh, nice to meet you, uh, Sir Tony, and thank you for uh, your evidence this morning. Um, we all have different memories of that time in, uh, in and around the 1998, and one of the ones that probably uh, is vivid in my mind is your visit to Coleraine and your writing on the, on, the, on the whiteboard. And I wanted to just question on the back of Mary's uh, question around legacy and all that goes with that. One of your pledges was equality, a fairness and equality uh, guaranteed for all. And my question would be how fair on victims of terrorism were the on the run letters to over 200 IRA fugitives? This is the on the runs? Yeah, I think some years back I appeared in front of the committee and went into this in detail. I mean, the, the problem with the on the runs was very, very simple. That might agree with it or not agree with it, but in the, in, in the Good Friday stroke Belfast Agreement, um, we essentially were releasing the people who'd been convicted. Right. So these are people who'd actually been convicted of acts of terrorism. The then naturally, and over time this grew, came an issue as to what you do about the people that, as it were, have not been convicted, but might, might be. Right. And those divided into two categories. The ones that the police thought there was insufficient evidence to charge, and the ones they thought that there would be sufficient evidence. And what we tried to do was obviously deal with the problem of the people in respect of whom the police decided there wasn't evidence to charge them. And it would be irrational if we were going after those people whilst we'd actually released the people who'd been convicted of terrorism. So that was what we were trying to, to resolve. And uh, you know, I, again, it was a very difficult situation, but we did the best we could with it. Yeah, and given that you know it was uh, a, a back room deal, there was no, uh, it wasn't written into any uh, text. You know, was it was it that that ultimately brought the IRA towards their ceasefire? Um, I don't think. It, I, th I think it, that was obviously a big issue for them. By the way, it was. You know, again, I dealt with this when I was in front of the committee those some years back. 
I mean, when people used to call it a secret deal, it was mentioned in parliamentary answers, and we were pretty open about it, that there was a problem we had to deal with. But I, look, there are, I think, the most difficult conversations I ever had with people uh, in the whole of the process were with the victims of the, of the troubles. Because these were decent people, members of whom's family had been killed or maimed by terrorists, and we were letting them out of prison. And there's no, I mean, it's a very hard conversation to have. Now, I can and I did justify it by saying we needed to do this for the peace process in order to give people a better future in Northern Ireland. I mean, three and a half thousand or more people died in the, in the troubles. We wanted to make sure that there weren't further deaths. But I agree, it's always, there is an element of compromise there that is morally uncomfortable. And there's no, I, there's no way out of that. But the releasing of prisoners was, was a well-known yeah. uh, element of the deal. And obviously, we were utterly opposed to it, utterly opposed. Um, but the on-the-runs was less well known um, and ultimately we have victims today who every time they see and hear of these individuals who receive the get out of jail free card um, you know re-traumatized uh, by seeing these individuals who you know blatantly <laughs> in many instances are and I've been banging this drum of a glorifying terrorism and, and flaunted in the face of victims. Yeah, the problem is they didn't have a get out of jail free cut because these were the people in respect of whom the police had said they didn't have sufficient evidence to charge them. So the problem was you, 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 were, you were always going to end up in a bizarre situation where you were going after those people, having released people who'd actually been convicted. I mean, that was the, the problem we were trying to deal with. Okay. Um, let's, um, let's, Can I just ask a question? Uh, no, I, uh, no, I'm going to move on to Stephen Perry. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, Sir Tony. And just to put on record our, our thanks for your efforts. In reaching the Good Friday Agreement, um, obviously we're coming up to a very important milestone, the 25th uh, anniversary. And I was a, a very junior member of the Alliance team back in those days as well, so I came across you many times in that, in that uh, particular regard. Um, just wanted to ask you a bit more detail around the issue of reform of the institutions. Um, you, in your analysis of the Alliance Party growth was, was, was accurate in many, in many ways. Um, did you see the institutions being set in stone in perpetuity, or was there an expectation that they would evolve over time in line with changing circumstances and changing demographics? And in particular, did you see some potential pitfalls with the system of community designations and um, the relegation of parties like, like ourselves to the, the other category? And do you see in particular that there's a strong case for reform of that dimension to reflect the, the changes that have clearly taken place over the past 25 years? Yes, no, absolutely. There's a case for, um, uh, there was a case for keeping, I think the, the agreement actually specifically provides for a review and, and yeah, you should always keep it under review. But it's got to, e evolution is the, mm. is the key phrase because you, you've got to do it with agreement. Um, and yes, I mean, I think as, as, as time goes on, there, there, there will be a, a, a growing sense for change, but I still don't think you can make a change to this agreement unless it's done consensually. If you do it and, and one part of the community feels it's aimed against them, then it'll be problematic. But I can understand the frustrations from uh, the Alliance point of view, um, it's, but it's just, and, and as I say, the agreement itself provides for the uh, possibility of review, but I think it's, it, it can only be done if, if the parties agree amongst themselves it's going to make for a more effective government. And I think right now, the priority has got to be to stabilize the existing situation, to get the yeah. protocol laid to one side and to, and to get the institutions back up and running. Could this probe you on a slightly different aspect of reform, which is around the use of, of, of vetoes. If a party has a veto over the, the current set of arrangements, um, are they likely to consensually agree to give up that veto in terms of moving towards a more uh, sort of modern, more normalised system of government? Particularly mindful that, um, particularly the changes that happened at St Andrews, 
lock us into the situation of this beauty contest as to which party is the, the largest on either side, but it also means the government can't be formed unless both of the two largest parties consent to it. And we've clearly had a situation where um, in recent past Sinn Féin stopped government from happening, more recently the DUP are happening, and people are very keen to move away from that sort of cycle of, of, of politics being held hostage. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, I, I can completely understand the frustrations people have and, you know, the, 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 the concept of veto is got a, it's got a kind of legal meaning and it's got a practical meaning and the problem will, will be if at a certain point in time the legal and the practical completely diverge. Mm. Now, I don't think we're at that yet. I think the practical reality is that you're you're going to need the consent of all people in order to make change. Um, but uh, you know, I can I completely understand the frustrations, and ultimately, will will people? I think people will consent to a change if they feel that the pressure within the community is such that people demand it for more effective government. But I don't. I think this is very hard. You know, the, the, one of the things I learned about this peace process is that there are some things the British government can really come in and, you know, <laughs> lay down a, a solution. But there are some things that are really going to depend on the parties themselves reaching an agreement. And you can do a certain amount of facilitation, but what you can't do is just order people because they, they, the reality is still, I think, that if any substantial part of the community disagrees with a change to the Good Friday Agreement, I think it's going to be very hard to get it done. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Sir Robert. Yes, um, just to develop on, on, on Stephen's point, um, we've had some evidence about whether or not the, 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 the designations of First Minister and Deputy First Minister should be just changed to call them Joint First Minister. Now, you know, it sounds cosmetic on, on, on one reading of it, but it might sort of open up a deeper truth about uh, a one way of unlocking the process. Do you think there's any merit in looking at that sort of change of designation? Well, I mean, I think my view would be there's, there's, that there may well be merit in it, but only if people come to it by agreement. That, that's my point, really. I, I just, my experience with this is that if a substantial part of either unionist or nationalist opinion is opposed to something, it's very hard to do it. Mm. So if, if they can come together and agree a way forward. Yeah. Now, you know, I totally get the point that Stephen was making, that in a sense you then say, well, they've got a veto over it. But yeah. I, th I think for the moment, I think the reality is without that agreement, it's hard to, to think of how it can work. But you know, one of the reasons why, in the end, the executive did get up and running just before I left office, and that extraordinary, you know, meeting with Mark McGuinness and Ian Paisley sitting together on the, you know, on the, on the settee, getting on well together, to all appearances, and even when the cameras weren't there, it appeared to be quite genuine, actually. Um, but one of the reasons was that they were they were both prepared to really make it work and so they had a with all of these these different elements within the the the, the agreement there is a form and there's a spirit and one of the things that again you learn over time is that the form doesn't work without the spirit right the spirit has got to be one where people genuinely are trying to make the thing work if, if that exists by the way you can even evolve the form but it's got to be people have got to decide in Northern Ireland that that's what they want to do and they want to find a way forward um, and you know it never happens without leaders being prepared to lead and this is honestly it's, it's so important to emphasize this point this would never have happened. And the difference between this peace process and many others around the world is that we had the benefit at that time of leaders who were prepared to lead. And if they hadn't been prepared to do that, and to have, you know, I used to have very frank, open conversations with unionist leaders, with Republican and nationalist leaders, where 
we had the ability to sit down and strategize together. They would say, look, here's my problem. You're going to have to help me find a way around it. And I might be able to help them find a way around it, but I could only do that because they were prepared to carry, in the end, to carry the burden themselves to get it over the line. And if you're not, if you don't have people prepared to do that, it, it, it's never going to work. None of these things will ever work. And, and it, it's very difficult because the simplest thing always to do as a leader of any political party, as I say, is just to, to get the round of applause. I mean, it's the easiest thing in politics to do. And, and, and in the end, you know, it's what a lot of leaders do. But if they actually want to make the change, they're going to have to find the way of pulling their people behind them. And that's the difference between leading and following. Can I you, you cut me off about on the run? I no, I was trying to, to make progress. Well, but I want to ask a very straightforward <laughs> question. Is one of the problems with the on the run letters was the source of the letters, because it didn't appear to be a wholly independent source, in the sense that I know we were before the PSNI's creation. I know there were issues about what the communities felt about the independence of the police and indeed the prosecutorial authorities. Surely would it, it would have been better for the source of the letters not to be so over, overtly political, which is what they were, weren't they? Yeah, look, I think, as I said at the time, you can look back in retrospect and say you, you, there are elements you could have handled differently, but you were always going to be de dealt with dealing with the same essential problem. It's, it's just what do you do about those, those people, as I say, who were not going to be charged? Well, I agree, but, but that's an independent process. It has to be, doesn't it? Yeah, the no. The process of investigation sure. I mean, in, 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 in retrospect, it, it, exactly. it, it could have been, and should have been handled better, as I think we said at the time. I mean, look, the Hallett Review went into this, and, and I basically think it was a pretty fair-minded piece of work. Yeah. Uh, Claire? I think the On the Runs letter were inappropriate, but unfortunately we're in a much worse position now. We're having universal uh, On the Run under the Legacy Bill as it stands. But just, just pick it up, and I agree entirely with the proposal to, to standardise the, the, the First Minister's title. In fact, I, I amended it to a vote um, uh, exactly that issue on a bill about a year or two ago here. Um, but following on from your, your comment that I thought was very insightful about unionism fearing slippy, slippery slopes, does it potentially mask an issue, and it's, it's a sensitive one, but do you think unionism is psychologically ready um, to be the, the, the marginally smaller partner? And if they aren't, what does that, um, what complexion does that put on the next couple of decades of, of change that are coming? And how do you think they could be um, assisted in getting their heads around that um, reality? Well, I mean, I actually, in my earlier comments, broke one of my, my, my carnal rules in this process, which is never try to offer political parties advice from, from, from the outside. Sometimes they, we can all use it. <laughs> it's, it's never Go on, give it to, give it to anyway, temptation. Go on. Yeah, no, but, but no, I think, look, I think that, that given the uncertainty that there is um, at the moment, you, you know, unionism wants and needs a lot of reassurance. Um, but Ultimately, it will be for the union's community itself to, to you know, they, they will, I think they will want to make this work. Now, you know, I know I've, I've seen the polls about uh, unionism over the protocol and what they, they agree or don't agree. I mean, I think there's probably a division within unionism. Um, well, I hope, because I hope that unionism can find a way of making it work. Because if, if it can't, then, then you know, Northern Ireland will remain unstable. And as I say, I personally believe that is contrary to the best interests of the Union. That's good advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think we go back to um, Stephen Farry, do we not? Yes, I'm covered. I covered. You're covered? Both together. Fine. Claire? North um, South, yes, uh, thank, thank you very much. What's your uh, assessment of, of um, Strand 2, um, the North South Dimensions, and thinking back to 1998, do you think non-unionist nationalists in particular would have signed up to the agreement without Strand 2? Because bear in mind they don't have Strand 2, it, it doesn't exist at the moment, it's not functioning. No, I mean Strand 2, Strands 2 and 3 were vital parts of the agreement, Absolutely, no, no doubt about that, we wouldn't have had an agreement without it. And, um, and that was a, a perfectly proper and correct recognition of nationalist in, in, uh, aspiration. 
Um, I think that, the, I mean, it was again an inevitable part of the agreement. So I'm not saying it should have been changed, but it's unfortunate that strand two can't operate unless strand one is operating. But that was the reality of the situation. Um, and I do think, I mean, I did put a certain emphasis on strand two and strand three and was, was active and used to attend some of those meetings. And I do think, particularly over these last few years, we, we could have been doing more to, to activate those and make them a forum in which the British and Irish governments could have tried to work out a way through things. I mean, I can't emphasize enough the, the enormous role played in the whole of this process by having um, an Irish government that was basically always looking to be constructive. I mean, it really was a, it was a great blessing. And people forget that you know, British-Irish relations were you know, pretty horrible for quite a long period of time in the past. But they, you know, I, uh, you know I've always paid tribute to, to Bertie Ahern and his leadership. I found him a very, very good person to work with and his whole system. You know, his people, they were, you know, you could have completely frank conversations with them. You could have private conversations with them. And then, you know, a whole series of things float from that, culminating in the, in the Queen's visit to, to, to Ireland, which is a great event. And, you know, always, again, my, my view was that, that the best thing in the interest of everybody is that the British and Irish governments had a good relationship because that also, it, it, it gave people comfort that there was, there was an attempt always to steer this process in a constructive way. And I think we should have done more in these last years. Now, it looks to me as if the relationship between the present PM and the Irish Taoiseach is, is much improved and better, and that's good. Uh, it's very important, a very important relationship. Um, and, and, you know, we're, even though public violence in the European Union, we're out of it, uh, nonetheless, there's a mass of things we have in common and, and, and interests we share and we should be working together. Okay. And on that, and, and absolutely, um, strands <coughs> two and three are of huge and unequal significance. And there's no attempt to create a hierarchy. It's just a matter of fact that strand two is currently hostage and, 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 and isn't operating and strand three is. Do you have any um, thoughts or advice for us on, on, on ways to enhance strand two and three as is a core part of the inquiry we're, we're doing at the moment? I think the best thing is the UK government really takes just, both of those yeah. two things really seriously and, and you know, gets into the right, the, the right relationship. And, and, and look, it, it, to, to those strands, which is, I think, much more act, should be much more active. That, that, that would be my, my advice. It's, only, it's, it, it's, it's a decision the government's got to, to, to take. It's got to do it very conscious of unionist feeling. But in the end, it is going to be important for us to have that, um, to have that means of trying to resolve some of these questions. Because by the way, as you go forward, there are going to be difficulties. I think instead there's going to be a real difficulty over the, um, the EU law that is now proposed. The, the is it the retained EU? Retained EU yeah. Yeah. Yes. There are areas of cooperation that are not covered by the protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, that is going to cause a lot of difficulty, and it's going to be important to keep a good relationship with the Irish government because I know from my own conversations in the last two or three years with the European Union, both at a leadership level and at a commission level, that they will pay a lot of attention to what the Irish government are advising them about this situation. So it's, it's just in the interests of the British government and in the interests of the union that you keep close relationship with the Irish government and with its leadership. I agree entirely. I think the relationship is core and the sort of structures come come after. Um, one final uh, question for, from me, and it's um, much further down the line. We've, we've many fences to jump um, before this, but um, thinking about the criteria uh, for a border poll in the event 
um, of, of future constitutional change. I take no issue with it not being um, nailed down in 1998. And, and as I say, um, we're not there yet, but I think there is a dynamic in the relationship. Have you, have you given any thought to what you think would be the appropriate signals or triggers um, to, to test um, opinion on constitutional change? given thought to it and decided it's absolutely not an issue for me to, <laughs> to engage in. I mean, there's a provision set out in the, in the agreement that's actually quite clear and was very carefully drafted, very, very carefully drafted at the time. Um, so and did, did you see it as one of those things that um, one will know when one knows, but you needn't write down what would help you to know? Yeah, but I think this is best left for another time and in line with the, the provisions in the agreement it's um, you know it's a, it's a subject of huge sensitivity and it's I don't it's probably not very helpful for me to <coughs> opine on it but I do think it's just worth pointing out that the structure of it as set out in the agreement you know when I've been rereading this agreement to come before the committee mm. you know there are certain lines that that trigger memories of long and protracted negotiation and uh, you know obviously one very sensitive issue is around that but the way it's set out here is the right way to proceed and it should be for the people at the time to decide it. Fair enough. You forgive me for having a crack at it. Don't you? <laughs> Thank you. If I was you I would do the same but if I was me I'd also do the same. <laughs> um, you, you touched on there with Miss Hannah the uh, Anglo-Irish relations which are I think important and possibly with a view to Dublin acting as a engaged bridgehead, if you will, into the European Union as the dust starts to settle. You obviously talk to uh, politicians and others north and south of the border. How, um, I think broadly our assessment as a committee is that from a very low point in fairly recent time, Anglo-Irish relations are on the improving Trajectory. There seems to be good relations and chemistry between the Taoiseach and the Prime Minister, so on and so forth. And I think everybody recognises the beneficial importance of that. Um, do you have a word or two? What, what, what's your assessment? Sort of overlooking the, the piece, I suppose, from 97 to today. Where, where, what would you see as ways of improving, if indeed improvements were required? Well, one thing you learn about the, the, the leadership level is there's just no substitute for personal interaction and for sitting down and and, and showing that you have mutual respect and understanding of the other person's politics. I mean, the worst thing when you're a leader dealing with another leader is, is not to show understanding of their politics, but to keep talking about yours. Because everyone's got their own politics and they're often in diametric opposition to each other. And what leaders expect you to be able to do is to, is to understand that and not grandstand around your own politics when you know, the other person has politics in an opposite direction. So the essence is to establish a relationship where you're able to say, look, okay, let's work this out together, see how we, we, we find a way through without giving either of us a political problem that we, we can't handle. And look, the, the European Union in the end is, they, they, they want to make this work. Mm. You know, they're, 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 you know, I know the senior people in the European leadership, the, <laughs> They're people who, who actually have a respect for the UK, even though they regret the decision to, to, to leave the European Union. And they regard, you know, the Northern Ireland peace process, one of the, the successes within the European space over the last quarter of a century. So they want to protect it. I mean, if, if, we, if we don't engage in irresponsible politics, but we're, we engage in sensible and responsible politics, we can, we can make it all work. I, I don't... I don't, I don't have any doubt about that because there's a lot of goodwill. Mm. And you know, the other thing to emphasize is that the Republic of Ireland itself is a transformed country. Mm. Oh, totally different how it was yeah. 25, 30 years ago. I mean, yes. You know, you only have to look at the person of the tea shop today to realize that. Yeah. Okay, it's a changed country. Yeah. And it's a, actually a dynamic country today. Mm. Um, and you know, when I was growing up, it was frankly not considered like that at all. No. But now it is. And, and therefore, 
and it's a successful member of the, the European Union. And so, you know, the Republic, in my view, they also have an interest in stability. And they, they don't want to create a situation in which you, you send a, a great tremor of uncertainty through the existing arrangements, because in the end, they're busy doing well, <laughs> creating success, and, and they, you know, provided the border remains open and the interaction between Northern Ireland and the Republic is, is good economically and socially and politically, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're content with it. So uh, I think by their own admission, the European Union and indeed the Commission's um, understanding of the sensitivities and concerns of um, political and societal unionism has developed um, very considerably over the last 18 months to two years as issues surrounding the protocol have been looked at. And hopefully that, is, that will give heart to a section of the community of Northern Ireland, which we all recognise is, and as your earlier remarks have indicated, it's important to carry as many people as possible and to make sure that both sides are, are, are broadly happy, or if not happy, then certainly not furious. Do you have a concern that, um, obviously, the, the role of Washington is, is, is very important, as we know, in the dimension of Irish politics and, indeed, Anglo-Irish politics? Does the same piece of work need to be done in Washington, given the sometimes fair and sometimes unfair characterization that the White House, irrespective of who is the occupant of it, is... Um, less well read up, let me put it that way, on unionism, its traditions, its concerns, the integrity of the UK. And we've got this hugely welcome visit of President Biden. I think President Clinton and Mrs. Clinton are intending to visit as well, which will be a huge fillip and will put the eyes of the world once again back onto the island of Ireland and the importance of the Good Friday Agreement. But is that, is that, is that a concern? So my experience I mean, first of all, this president, by the way, is, you know, deeply committed um, to, to Ireland and, 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 and actually does know a lot about its history and uh, the situation there today. And I, I found, I mean, President Clinton was immensely helpful mm. over the negotiation of the, of the Good Friday and Belfast Agreement. Um, president Bush actually visited a school in Northern Ireland, I think, uh, in the course of his time and, uh, again, was, was uh, very supportive of the process. So my view of, of, of the American administration on, on this issue is if the UK government looks as if it's in the saddle, riding forward, knows where it's going and what it's doing, they'll just get behind it. And so I think this is why the negotiation of the, of, of the agreement around the protocol has been important. And it's, it's important also to say about that, because I, I, I didn't say this when I was talking about it earlier, I mean, I have looked at, in, in detail at, the, um, at the, the Windsor Agreement, and the truth is, number one, there is an acceptance on both the EU side and the, and the UK side to find practical ways through, and both have shown flexibility to do that. The Europeans have shown a quite a lot of flexibility compared with what they could have done if they just decided to take a dogmatic position. They haven't. But secondly, what the negotiated changes that the Prime Minister, this, this Prime Minister, has, has done have, in my view, substantially narrowed the potential for conflict to arise of a, of a constitutional sort. So I think, to be fair, this is why I think when people look at it, you're, okay, you can argue about the degree to which the ECJ is still involved in certain aspects, but the truth is, along with that storm and break, you, you, the, the actual, in substance terms, the issues are substantially resolved. Mm. And that's why I, I hope people do give it, give it support. But it, it's... And therefore, that's why I think for the American administration, what they will think is, look, 
if the UK government is, you know, is back with a clear direction, that, then we will want to support it. And the other thing is, which, which I think has been of assistance over the years, but I know uh, that this, this president is interested in, is what America can do for the Northern Ireland economy. Hmm. Yes. And, and that will also be important. Sure. Um, Robin Walker? And then... Thank you. Thank you. you put a great emphasis, and I think understandably, given um, how the uh, agreements were reached on the interpersonal relationships and the trust on a one-on-one -on -one, um, level that's, that's been built as part of the process. Clearly, part of the genius of the agreement itself is the, the interlinking of the different strands and, and um, the, uh, the, the, the role of the balance between strand two and strand three in that respect. Do you think it's a, a matter of regret that fewer of your successors as Prime Ministers have taken part directly in the British-Irish Council? And, and do you think, you know, I know you don't give advice to political parties, but would your advice in general be for um, Prime Ministers of the United Kingdom to take a personal and direct engagement in that? Yes, and I think particularly now it's important. Um, Look, I understand when the, I mean, one of the benefits of when something ceases to be a big issue, it's, it stops coming across the, the Prime Minister's desk and you've always got a thousand other issues to deal with. And in a way, it's what, what you want is to be able to spend less time on one issue than another. But I think, um, I, th I think right now, particularly, as we see this. The Lucid poll uh, showed that only 35% of unionists would actually vote yes to the Belfast Agreement with 54% uh, voting no if, if the vote was to take place again. Um, in your opinion, why do you think unionists have really you know, moved away from support for the Belfast Agreement? Um, well, <laughs> one of the difficult, because I think you were saying is 54% are against and 35% in favour? Yeah. So it's if your political leadership is giving a message that this is bad, you know your support will often consider it to be bad. So I think it's not just a question of, of what people kind of think objectively, but also where they're they're led. But I understand that unionism will always feel that it's um, that it's at risk to some degree. I mean, how, how, how could you not because of the circumstances of the situation? In exactly the same way that I think unionism will always be in part distrustful of a UK government. I think you know that. My, that's my experience. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, and you will always say there's good reason for it. But you know, going back to Margaret Thatcher's time. Oh, the Anglo-Irish Agreement. Yeah. You go back just to think of the John Major's time. I don't yeah. think that there's never going to be a situation where there isn't that distrust. But I, that's why I come back to the question of strategy and leadership. That it is important to work out, and that's why I said to you, I'm a, I'm, I'm a union. It's not in order to, to, you know. To, to make some great political statement of my own belief, but to say, to explain where I was coming from, the first speech I made as Prime Minister, the first, um, in 